so yes, I'm Simon Thompson, um, and I'm going to talk about what we do at BT. And I should uh, emphasize that there are lots of people who have done the work that I'm going to talk about, so it's not all my work. Um, if it was, it would be fantastic, and I'd be really good. But in fact, there's a big team who do loads of stuff. Um, and I've mentioned some of the names there, but there are a whole load more people. Um, and uh, I run a team, just, uh, just to introduce what I do, I've got um, three groups who work for me. Uh, we've got a social physics group. There are people who are looking at employee motivation and nudge and um, uh, morale, um, uh, how to get people to do the right thing with a customer uh, without shouting at them, because if you shout at people, they tend not to do the right thing. You know, it's much better to uh, construct um, incentive frameworks with the right motivations behind them, but that's a data-driven process. Um, I've got a diagnostics team. A lot of the work I'll talk about today comes out of the diagnostics team. And those are people who are taking uh, telemetry information and uh, using physical models of the behavior of devices and networks to then determine conditions that arise and, and using inference to then uh, uh, better ascribe root cause uh, root causes to those, uh, those error conditions that have arisen. And then I've got a big data engineering team, and those people construct data infrastructures, and they construct approaches to types of data and approaches to data science as well and uh, help the, the company to uh, adopt big data and data science techniques and machine learning techniques. And I will talk about the company because this is corporate. Uh, and um, we are a large company. We're not just the uh, UK network. We have uh, presence in 180 countries around the world. One of the key things that we offer is a way for corporates to do global connectivity uh, and to run their businesses in, in every territory there is. Uh, transport data around that. Uh, we, uh, we generate significant revenues. We employ about 100,000 people around the world. Uh, the bulk of those are in the UK, and we recruit uh, people uh, to, uh, to refresh this workforce. So we're recruiting about 300 graduates a year and about 550 apprentices a year. And I was just talking uh, before we started about the kind of experiences that apprentices and graduates have uh, in the data science team at, at BT. And uh, obviously, if anybody's interested in, in coming and doing an internship or joining, have a chat with me afterwards. And uh, I'm always very keen to bring people in. Um, what we do uh, is what we call purposeful innovation. And so this is rather different from uh, research that you'll find in universities. So uh, this isn't uh, curiosity-driven research. This is purpose-driven research. So we have um, a business that uh, uh, needs to uh, solve specific problems uh, and uh, to develop specific opportunities. And we apply research skills to uh, dealing with that. And that's, that's the difference why you need a, a research team in industry versus in, in academia. Because if you rock up to academia and you say, this is the problem. You must work on this problem. Most academics run a 1,000 miles. They're not, they're not keen on doing that. They want to pursue their curiosity. Um, and this is uh, Wheatstone and um, uh, Croft, I think his name was. And they, in 18, 1846, they filed the first patents around the electric te telegram and founded a company uh, which uh, actually turned into um, one of the companies that the General Post Office acquired. And then that turned into BT. Uh, 100 years later, more than 100 years later. So we have a very long history of fusing science and engineering for commercial purposes. Uh, and we've had a number of very significant world firsts while we've been doing that. Uh, so um, uh, we, we've done things like uh, the first telephone call via satellite. Um, and um, uh, we were heavily involved in turning uh, single-mode optical fiber into a viable technology for data transmission. So uh, the first single mode optical fibers were, were developed in, at AT&T. Uh, but BT did a lot of the first field trials and deployments and, and deliveries of that technology and built a lot of the practical technology uh, that's enabled the internet. And we're still busily doing that today. Uh, so for instance, we uh, recently uh, trialed 
um, uh, single mode fiber going up to three terabytes per second in the, the core. Uh, and this is uh, giving us an assurance that our core networks will be able to carry all of the, uh, the communications traffic that uh, a, a modern economy requires to carry. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're not going to face capacity crunches because we know how to do these terabyte transmissions, uh, terabit transmissions, sorry, not bytes, bits. Um, and uh, we're also extending the technology in other ways. So there's the access network. Um, we've run trials of technology called XG.Fast, and this is uh, very high-speed copper networking over hundreds of meters. We can, we've shown, we've demonstrated up to five gigabit speed uh, with that technology. Um, and also security is obviously fundamental, so we've built uh, uh, real links using quantum cryptograph cryptography, key exchange, quantum key, key exchange uh, between at Astral Park and Cambridge, um, and we've run them at uh, 200 gigabits per second. Um, so, you know, practical, practical quantum security there, and that's uh, some of the, the first we've done. Also, just recently, we, we had a, uh, a world first around uh, MIMO, uh, and 5G with Bristol University out of Astral Park, uh, again, breaking another record. So all the time looking to uh, push the envelope there. Um, in this presentation, uh, please stop me, uh, ask questions, interrupt me whenever you like. It's much better if it's interactive, so uh, just uh, raise anything as you go along. And uh, if, if you feel you'd like something else to be explored, you know, I'm very happy to do that as well. So just, just say and we'll do what, you know, you're the audience, okay? Um, but what I'm going to try and talk about, um, if it's okay with you guys, uh, I'm going to just go over some of the data science projects that we run at BT and BT Research to give you a flavor of the kind of things that go on. Uh, then I'm going to uh, pick out some of the issues and challenges with that and uh, what we're doing in terms of research to deal with those challenges. Um, and uh, I thought it would be good to flag the overall message of the talk before, uh, before we started. And this is my, my key message, which is that unicorns, data science unicorns in particular, are bad and dangerous. We don't like data science unicorns. And what we actually are interested in is architecture and uh, supply, right? So consumption. Because... Uh, the architecture is the enabler for us to be able to do data science. Uh, the architecture sets up the environment which, it's necess uh, which is necessary in order to be successful with data science. The consumption models actually produce the, the value that's needed to hydrate the data science activity and uh, build out the architecture. And that's the lesson, the key lesson so far for me about uh, the work we've done on data science at BT, and uh, I'll elaborate. So before I start about the data science, I'll just tell you about the enabling infrastructure that we've built and developed, um, uh, what we, where we started. Like, like a lot of people, we started with an experimental research cluster. Um, as Hadoop emerged as a technology, we, we had repeated attempts to stand up clusters. We, we stood up other types of clusters, like condor clusters and um, uh, oh, what was it called? Um, oh, various other Linux Beowulf clusters, right? We, we, we built a Beowulf cluster at one point. And um, the, the, the lesson that came back to us repeatedly until about 2011 was uh, these were not fit for enterprise use at that time. They were interesting projects. They, were, uh, they could do some good things, but they, they weren't offering the bangs for bucks that we needed. Um, and then in, in about the middle of 2011, that changed. We, 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 we were able to do the sums that showed that uh, we would get uh, a really positive research, uh, return for an investment in a cluster. Uh, we made that investment. We spent quite a long time, uh, a couple of years, learning how to use it, how to actually get value out of it for our business. And then it suddenly took off. And uh, in about uh, 20, late 2013, uh, we were, we were having quite a lot of panics where the, the, the business load on the cluster was just extreme and we couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't support it anymore. And uh, luckily, 
the business had decided to productionize before then and would work with the business to set up a production cluster. And uh, just as things were really getting a bit hot on the research cluster, the production cluster came on stream. We were able to shift, uh, shift our jobs onto that. That freed us up to go off and build new research clusters, GPU clusters, this kind of thing, build other infrastructures. But it meant that the business had a production capability. And the interesting thing about that production capability is that it's a multi-tenant, uh, multi-user, secured um, uh, environment. So it's, uh, it's not just a, a, you know, a standard sort of um, Hadoop in implementation. It's got all the bits you need to actually run it in an enterprise. And uh, another interesting thing about it was that um, they changed out all the kit and all the, the they've repeatedly changed the, uh, uh, the, the software, the, 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 the infrastructure, um, and it's kept going. And uh, a lot of people wouldn't find that particularly remarkable because they've not worked in an enterprise setting. But uh, a regular event in enterprise settings is that you try and do an upgrade uh, or you try and uh, migrate your, uh, your infrastructure and it doesn't work. And so this is regarded as a, as a pretty big achievement that we've managed to migrate the thing and, and evolve it uh, and it's kept going all the way along. Um, another piece of infrastructure that it's worth commenting on is um, privacy. And I'm a big believer that for data science to work you need lots of clear rules and clear understandings uh, in your organization about what can and can't be done. Because my experience is that if you don't have those, what happens is that people are very cautious. And they will say, we're not doing this because it's taking a risk and I don't want to take a risk. And they will step back uh, from making a, a decision that they feel uh, might uh, upset a customer, right? And so one of the important things that we've done is that we've got a privacy policy, which is publicly available. Uh, it's on the internet and, uh, internet, and we say what we're going to do with all the data and why. What, what are we up to with your data? What are we up to with other people's data? It's laid out and spelled out there uh, for everybody to see, and it's in all the terms and conditions. And that's been critical in order to allow us to go forward and use some of this data uh, in, you know, in, in ways which enable our services to work. Right? So fundamentally, what we're trying to do with the data is to make service work better or at all. And you know, obviously, without data about uh, your TV viewing, we can't make recommendations to you because we don't know what you want to watch. So that's, you know, that's what we're doing with the data there. And it's all spelt out uh, publicly, which is an important thing for us. I think it's, it's in straight, I find it to be very straightforward. Um, I think there's a, it's a very difficult challenge um, because obviously it, it, it is a formal document, but it's, it's pretty straightforward to me. So I'd be interested to hear feedback about that. I think we all would. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the projects we've done, uh, and I've tried to make this uh, less boring than it otherwise would be. This is, this is an absolutely key um, project for us. This is about the telemetry we get off the access networks. Uh, we have various technologies which are delivering broadband into people's homes, and they run in a variety of ways. And uh, we, we collect the data off them and use those, uh, that information uh, to improve the service that we can deliver uh, to the customers and to get efficiency gains and uh, uh, operational performance. Um, so the GIF on the right-hand side is a fun uh, side effect of collecting this data where we can see when it's thundering with very high degree of uh, resolution because we operate copper networks, and copper networks are very responsive uh, to lightning. And so when there's an electrical storm, we can see it roll across the country. And that's, that's just one from 2015 there that rolled across Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about this, um, uh, this application uh, is that it isn't one application. Okay, So this is a, a set of... Um, uh, applications and use cases enabled by uh, a data source and data flow. Um, and what we've done is that we've ingested data from 
uh, the lines across the country, and in fact, we have to do that twice, so this slight bit of messiness. We have a regulatory separation. One half of the business is not allowed to see the other half of the business's data. They have to be physically separated on different infrastructures. Both sides uh, want to do this. Both sides have their own data source. On one side, the consumer side of the business has hubs in people's homes, which are modems, which talk to uh, the access network to get service. And on the other side, uh, the open reach side, uh, they have DSLAMs in boxes on the streets, which are modems, which talk to the hubs in order to establish service. And part of the dialogue between these hubs is um, spectrum analysis about what's going on on the copper in between. So they, uh, they exchange information about the frequencies that they can see uh, and the noise in the frequencies uh, that they can see data being transmitted over. And we can then use that to infer the condition of the lines in between. Uh, we can use that to infer whether there's um, uh, high attenuation, uh, whether there's noise, whether there's a power line adapter present in the network. Uh, all sorts of information can be garnered like this, and, and it appears in both, both organizations. Then, of course, it's very separate because the different organizations have access to other data infrastructures which they enrich this data with. Um, so, for example, the consumer side will understand something about the customer's accounts. Um, the open reach side will understand about the network inventory that's underpin underpinning uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the service. So at that point, there's a separation. And then we do processing. The different parts of the business do different, uh, different processing activities uh, to apply this, uh, uh, this insight or to create the insight from the data. So there's a lot of ad hoc investigations to try to understand what's going on in a particular problem area or in response to a surge in complaints. Um, that can lead to actions around dealing with uh, equipment vendors. Uh, so you might find uh, that a software update has gone wrong or that there's some new piece of hardware which isn't playing well with another piece of hardware, and you can uh, take some action on the basis of that. And of course, you can also look and say, well, uh, where would we be best targeting investment or shifts to different technology uh, using this information so we can actually uh, determine how to better uh, invest in the network and get more return for the investment. Uh, this led to um, uh, quite an interesting application um, where uh, I think it's quite illustrative because what, what, we, what we did was we had to build, or we've had to build in almost every application, a series of interfaces to... Uh, take the, the data science and present it to customers, right? Without this, we find it almost impossible to extract the value. And, and what happens is that we find that our internal customers will go off and use the interfaces uh, and the data that's the, 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 the inferenced data that we produce, the data products. Um, uh, they, they'll spend a lot of time looking at them and working with them and then come up with insights that we wouldn't have been able to uh, to produce or to understand because we don't have the real depth of domain expertise that some of these people do. And this was a case in point because what happened was they were looking at line test results and there were some crazy results and it just didn't make sense. And um, uh, what, what it turned out to be was that the mechanical equipment that was doing the testing of the lines had, had faults in it. It was breaking because it was very old. Uh, and uh, there, was a, there, there hadn't been a sufficient maintenance schedule to do the testing properly or to maintain that equipment. And what that then led to was uh, an investment program uh, to renew this testing equipment to give us better data uh, about what was going on in, in the network. And it explained a lot of behavior that was, was at that time, this is some years ago, unexplained. Uh, so that was good. Okay, this is another example. This is uh, about TV data, and I'm showing this slide. I've written all over it with my new scrawly pen. Um, uh, I think the point here, this is the TV architecture, and it's very complex. And um, uh, this is a point, again, about what happens in real data science projects. 
practical architectures in industry are complicated because they have many use cases that are sitting off the back of them. Just like that big data uh, architecture I showed a second ago supported many use cases. Here, this is a, a legacy architecture that we, we, we use internally to run uh, a TV network um, uh, artifact. So this is for content management and content distribution. And uh, we, we've then had to build out extra infrastructure off the back of that and with respect to that uh, to provide analytics services and, and inference services off the back of it. Um, and this is not what you would do if you had a green field, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't collect your data in this way or manage the data in this way. But that's what happens when you have to deal with legacy, and there's lots of legacy. Again, the TV analytics work led to the building of specialist interfaces. And apparently, these do mean important and interesting things to the TV people who use them. Um, they mean very little to me at all. I've had to blank out lots of program names and, and things because um, I was warned about copyright implications uh, of, of doing a lecture where somebody's copyright might be in, uh, um, uh, infringed. Um, but you know, this is all about uh, what content is being consumed and what the value to our subscribers is of that content. So you know, are our subscribers over-indexing on a particular sporting event, right? Is it unexpectedly successful? What kind of subscribers want that? How much should we be going and spending on getting more of that type of content? Should we get more of it or none? You know, what's the, what's the answer here? And what we've been able to do is to give very accurate, very high resolution information about that and say, you know, these are the values of the artifacts that you're buying, which is very important for us as a business. Um, this means a lot more to me because I understand something about networks because I've worked in BT for such a long time, so you kind of pick it up, uh, a bit of it anyway. I wouldn't claim to be an expert like some of my colleagues, but some knowledge. And this is the other thing that we've done with the TV data. Again, we've been able to use it to understand the true impact on the quality of experience that various network conditions have for those customers. So. Uh, you know, you can, you can see that uh, a noise margin can be very, very impactful for customers consuming TV data because they will abandon their sessions. And therefore, we need to act strongly if we have low noise margins uh, for, for TV customers, right? So that's the kind of insight we can drive investment in the things that matter for the consumer rather than a technical objective, which sounds good, but actually makes very little impact for an end user. Okay. There's a different infrastructure, different project we did, um, and this is really almost entirely due to my colleague Rob, Rob Claxton, who uh, took this on and, and, and did some brilliant work around this. So we have lots of core records. We have um, uh, tokenized records, which uh, show uh, where calls are coming into the network and, and what the patterns of, of received calls are. Um, the issue here is we know that there's a lot of abuse going on, right? So everybody knows that they get nuisance calls. People ring your mobile and they want to sell you stuff and you don't want to speak to them, and they go on and on. And of course, they especially target vulnerable people, right? So they, they go for people who've fallen for a scam in the past or somebody who they believe is vulnerable due to being on some database, some list held nefariously in some other place. Well, uh, what we wanted to do is to get after this and stop it or to, to impede it. I don't think we'll ever stop it, but we want to get in the way of them, make it more costly uh, for them, less productive. And, and what we discovered was that we didn't understand this data well at all. And so what we had to do was to build ways of understanding what was going on in the data so we could we could see what was happening and why. And this meant picking up a number of different uh, techniques. There's one in particular called ISACS, which was developed in the pages of 2008, so it's a little bit old. And then we use classic things like um, periodicity, so just fast Fourier transforms to, to, to say, you know, we've got this kind of periodicity in there. And uh, outlier discovery as well, you know, the, the, the degree of outliers, the number of outliers, just simple statistics. But overall, what that, that enables us to do is, have I, oh, yeah, here, this is a better slide. So we're able to query 
and describe this data source in, in the round, in the large, right? So we're able to say, how many unusual patterns are there in this, right? How many repeating patterns, how many patterns that shouldn't be repeating in the way that they are repeating are in this data source, right? So we can, we can use uh, this, this characterization of behavior to then understand the larger data resource. And that led to a very successful project called 1572, which Rob drove and is still driving. Um, and I just sit and applaud and, and then talk about it in presentations. Uh, but Rob's, Rob's team are, are, are the people who've, who've, who've contributed the research element to this. And this has been launched and runs and is fielded out to millions of subscribers. And uh, we're improving it and uplifting it and working on it to try to make it as effective as we can. Of course, this is an arms race because the other people who are exploiting the network want to get round it. So they're always trying and we're always trying to be better. And that's a challenge. And I should also say, um, you know, like for the other projects, the research element here w is, is one part of the overall delivery. Um, a lot of work has to be done in terms of checking and managing and handling the output of the classifiers that we've developed uh, and built into the scoring system that we use to determine our index of nuisance. Um, uh, so we've, you know, we, we've done that. That produces the, 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 the uh, candidate lists, and then those are screened by a whole load of other processes because, obviously, we don't want to do things like block a doctor's surgery from uh, uh, ringing up all its customers and saying, you know, we, we've got a problem. We're shut today. Don't come in. It would be a disaster. We, d we just can't do that. So there's whitelisting, and then there's checking, and, you know, we go around a, a bit of a a loop to make sure that happens. Um, and uh, yeah, there we are. So 1572, big success. And then again, uh, another way of getting data in and another kind of infrastructure. Uh, this was the project that kicked us off uh, around doing stuff with deep learning. Um, and uh, uh, I um, got hold of some pictures of uh, surveys. There was a guy in my group, Michael, uh, Rob's group, who was building a, an app to um, uh, help uh, collect and index survey data. And this was not a very intelligent app at all, uh, but we had a live business problem we'd been asked to help with where they, they were spending too much money on surveys and they felt that they, if they could index them by date, by capturing the spreadsheets and putting them in a database somehow, then um, you know, they'd be able to find recent surveys and not do some surveys, and that would be good, wouldn't it? And we looked at this, and it was quite a boring project, but Michael had cracked on with it quite well, so that was cool. Um, and uh, I, I, I read about deep learning, and I, I wondered, well, what would happen if we tried running deep learning algorithms against these pictures? And um, uh, it was quite funny. The, the, in fact, the... Um, the, the, the deep learning systems I tried were from the University of Toronto, and they actually did give really good descriptions and captions of the scenes. And uh, then I cheated, and I chopped the scenes up into bits to see what would happen when I showed uh, just parts of the image to uh, uh, the, the deep network. And uh, it told me the road was, in fact, snakeskin, and it told me that the wiring in the cabinet was, in fact, flowers, um, which amused us greatly. You can imagine us all sitting around and laughing about that. It's very funny. Um, but what, what it did tell us when we, we did the initial inspection was that there was a potential uh, to create a much higher degree of automation here and change how our processes might work in the future. And, and what we've got now is, is work going on where people, whenever they're opening a cabinet, take a picture of it with their iPhone, the engineers have iPhones, and then they use a little app to send it into uh, our database. Um, we store that there, and we're collecting uh, these, uh, this pictorial data about the condition of the equipment in the field. And what we're able to use is a deep network, and we've used uh, 
convolutional networks, uh, which we did transfer learning with. So this is an interesting project from my point of view because we were able to use transfer learning versus an image net network that was public domain. It came from the CAPE model zoo and we converted it to TensorFlow. And then Michael's tried various different ways of doing the transfer learning. But essentially, we tore off the top layers and we trained other layers and we got really great performance in terms of recognizing what's going on in our cabinets. And of course, this is the other interesting thing about this is um, typically when I read about deep learning, people talk about, oh, I built a deep network and it's done something and it's cool. OK, look at that. It turns out we've had to build a great long pipeline of different networks to do different things with the images, to mask them, to manage the scale, uh, to pick out different bits. And this collection of networks is what underpins what is now a, a somewhat practical application. Okay, But quite different, I think, from my feeling from the literature, which is sort of, you know, have a magic bucket and throw everything into it. Much more, a, much more of an engineered approach in reality. But I also think that the crowdsourcing images and, and having that image database is, is an interesting aspect of the work. And we get some very, you know, we get some good results. We're able, again, to build uh, systems that answer queries about uh, the real world, in this case, images, uh, and we can ask it to show us all the cabinets that are full. And we can ask it to show us all the cabinets that have got corrosion and that are half empty and have particular types of technology in them. And it can classify those from the images. And uh, when we, we started getting the, the results, in terms of numeric results of the performance of the networks, uh, I actually wouldn't believe it when, when we started going, uh, going through them. And I uh, dismissively, uh, and in a very silly, irritated way, told the team to go back and do it again. And they, they went back and said, no, this is exactly what we said in the first place. And they took me through it using short words and, and drawings so that I understood what they were talking about. And uh, it turns out you know, that these, these algorithms really are extremely capable uh, in terms of picking out these kind of features, which is fantastic. OK, so this is all great. We've done lots of projects. So what are the issues around this? And I return to the idea of architecture and consumption model. Um, so this is something I think everybody will be familiar with as a story. Uh, this is the... Um, fun fair story of data science. Uh, basically, you want to go to the fun fair. It's going to be great. We're going to go on the roller coaster. It'll be great. Um, actually, what happens is that you spend three hours driving to the amusement park. You park in a muddy field. You walk for half a mile. You queue for two hours. You go to the ride. You get 30 seconds on the ride, right? And, and that's very much uh, a standard experience that we've had in data science. Uh, you know, we have this desperate search for the relevant data, uh, trying to bring the data together, trying to deal with the data, the various aspects of the data, and then we essentially end up often just counting occurrences and handing it over. You know, it's really unsatisfactory. And we develop um, polished architectures and implementations of our uh, data applications like this, but it's important to remember this, this, is, this is true. This is what's happening. We are implementing this. It is you know, very honed and modern and polished and performant. But it's what, it's what you get after you win, right? This is, this is when things are in production. This gets built. Actually, the new problems always look much more like this. And, and, and that's really, really uh, difficult. Um, so. Uh, why is that? Why are we in this position? And I think, I think it's a lot to do with the demand and supply around data science. And, and this is where the architecture and, and consumption model comes in. Uh, if, you, if you think about somebody like Alan Sugar, right, he's a great trader. Right? He's, a, he's this fantastic entrepreneur and businessman. But would Alan Sugar do very well if we took him out and put him into the context of, say, Somalia or Afghanistan? And the answer is no, it, it, it wouldn't work. And the reason it wouldn't work for him is because there's no rule of law there. There's no, there's no set of structures that he understands. There isn't a, uh, you know, like in medieval Europe, 
things started to happen when people built walled towns and, and, and there were laws and guilds and structures that everybody understood. And there was a market to sell stuff to, right? So then people started to do things. And I think that a lot of the problems that I see uh, in corporate data science come down to this, is getting, getting these structures right so that you can actually then build out the functions that are needed to deliver. And you know, here's a, a set of, of functions that, that data science needs, okay? So you need a platform manager, you need audit of the data, you, you need rules around the data, you need d data engineers, right? And, and, and uh, you see I've rubbed out in red this was from a, a slide deck I did about where we, where we stood, and, and I've deleted my view on where we were up to with that. But these are all needed, um, needed elements to support data science activity. And you need to have an operating model about how you're going to fund it and organize it as well. Um, and these are, these, are, these are fundamental to uh, uh, having you know, the architecture as well as the physical architecture to, to, to deliver value. And then in terms of the demand side, uh, the consumers, we've got social and psychological uh, problems to deal with, right? Um, so Edward Deming had this, has this, great, uh, uh, this great quote. Edward Deming is a business uh, guru, rebuilt Japan, rebuilt the economy of Japan after the Second World War. Everybody loves Edward Deming, great guy. And he said, in God we trust, everyone else needs to bring data, right? But the problem is that that doesn't uh, account for the actual behaviors we observe in the real world. Um, and we're seeing it writ large now. We have fake news. We have conspiracy theories. Um, uh, people are irrational. We see that all over the place. But we see it in the corporate world as well. So we'd like to think that we'd have a coalition of, uh, of well-meaning people who are giving well-structured advice and of course, in, in everybody's head, they are that well-meaning person, right? This isn't, this isn't uh, wickedness that's going on here. This is you know, people who genuinely, genuinely believe they are right and they are doing the best thing, which makes them especially dangerous, right? Um, but what, what we in fact see is you know, people have interests and beliefs. They have confirmation bias. They, they want to believe the world is a particular way. They've been told that the world is a particular way. They have a a preconceived idea of the structures. And uh, they, they don't want to abandon it. Uh, they, they, want to, they want it to be true, and they find evidence that will support that. And, and this is very difficult to overcome. And it's especially difficult to overcome because often what they will do is they will use attribution. Uh, so they will, they will find um, uh, the, the, the facts that suit them, which are attributable to a well-meaning, well-believed resource, and then they will promote them uh, widely, but they won't promote the whole story. They'll promote the bits that suit them to do so, or suit their mindset to do so. And I think this is something that the data science world has missed out on. We talk about science, right? And, and this, there's a, an XKCD cartoon which is actually drawn by somebody who can draw things right so go and look at that for the art um, but basically the idea is that if you pull a lever and it electrocutes you scientists will tend to say will that happen every time right uh, you know how many times out of a hundred will I get an electric shock let me count right that's science normal people don't do that normal people say I'm not doing that again I don't want to have that experience and you know, we tr we're sort of pretending that we're in the top level, but actually the reality of data science is that, that it gets conducted environment, in environments with those standard behaviors at the bottom. And it's even worse than that because actually in science itself, there are lots of well-documented examples where um, everybody had a belief about how the world was, and they did experiments that demonstrably did not reproduce the results that they were supposed to reproduce, but then they found all sorts of reasons not to believe those results that they'd just obtained and instead confirm the previous beliefs, right? And there's a great example that uh, Feynman came up, came up with about the, the history of the charge of the, uh, of the electron. And uh, 
the guy who first did the oil drop experiment dropping down, he just had a wrong value for the viscosity of air. It was just wrong. I mean, it was the best he had. He was doing the best he could, but it was wrong. And so it made his result a bit wrong. Not, not wildly wrong, but a bit wrong. And then the whole of science started replicating this result, and they had the right viscosity, but they all, they all agreed with him. And, and they, there was a very slow and gradual change in the agreed value of, of uh, uh, the electron over time, of the charge of the electron over time. But the results from all the replication attempts should have justified an immediate change in that value because that's the results people were seeing. But they found all sorts of ways just to disregard the inconvenient bits that would have led them to the reality. And again, that's, that's a problem that we've got around data science. And then we've got what I call the shaman issue as well, which is, uh, I said it in the earlier slide, in fact, you know, if you, it, the standard behavior towards people, and this is why the physicists did the, the milk and stuff, the standard behavior when you come with the facts that actually your preconceived ideas were wrong is to be really angry with you. People don't like that. They don't want to hear it. So, you know, how do we, how do we accommodate that? So those are my... Uh, complaints about data science, the problems I perceive. So, you know, it's beholden on us to try and do something about that. So what are we trying to do to resolve this? And the first thing I'd say is, please help me. Okay, this is an appeal for aid as much as anything else. We need help with this. What we're trying to do is to reduce data science, get rid of data science, and have a science of data. Okay, and this is something... I thought I'd invented, I thought, let's talk about a science of data. And then I conceded that, in fact, it was in conversations with my oppo, Rob, that, that we'd had this idea together. And then Rob actually looked up uh, the history of it, and it turns out that people have been talking about the science of data since statistics was invented, right? So it's, everybody wants to do the science of data and always has done. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, can we characterize this stuff we're working with and can we describe in quantitative terms what is going on with it, okay? And this, this has been in the popular discussion, the, 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 the environment around. So one of the things that drove big data was the idea of data gravity, right? And Google, in particular, talked about data gravity. And it's something I majored on when we were selling the idea of big data in BT. We are going for data gravity. We want to get the data together in one place. It will pull itself together because then we will be able to do inference at the speed of, uh, the speed of uh, decision making rather than at the speed of um, contractor engagement to write SQL and then send us the results three weeks later. And how many times was I in projects where results would arrive and nobody would remember why we'd asked for them? We, didn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't even think why it was we asked for that from the people who went off and wrote the queries. Well, we didn't want that. We wanted it to be that afternoon, that day, and you know that's what data gravity was going to enable for us. But of course, we we didn't have any real characterization of it. We don't. We still don't have a characterization of that. But that's the kind of value I want to go after. Flow and friction is another one, right? We have uh, three thousand data assets in BT. It's not uncommon. That's corporate data infrastructures are often like this. Um, how long and how much does it cost for data to flow across that infrastructure, right? Can we, can we measure and characterize that? That's a challenge. The two we've actually done some, I think, some work on, although nothing like enough. Cartography, which is really trying to describe the relationship of data one piece of data to another piece of data within a data asset. And, and the other one is quality. I call it half-life because it's more physics-y and it sort of sells my idea of, of, of data science, science of data. But, um. So uh, the half-life idea, though, is, is actually really about can we describe data with more things than just data schema, right? Um, and people have tried to do this in the past, so... We see in data science, people talk about lineages, and they try and describe the process by which they're processing a piece of data. Okay, but that just is within your project just now. And then we have W3C, uh, there's a guy called Luke Moreau, who's at 
King's now. He was at Southampton, but he's at King's, Un King's in London. Um, and he, he worked with the W3C to produce this provenance standard. Uh, where does the data come from? Who, who, who originated this data? So there's some, some stuff there. Uh, and I was really heartened to find uh, some people from BlackRock who've produced a thing called Top Notch, which is a descriptive standard which says, which attempts to, to make assertions about your data and the kind of things you should see in it. So these are a little bit like Oracle triggers uh, in your database, um, but you describe them in JSON. And, and, and the point of this project is that you, the guys say it, it's uh, about institutionalizing knowledge of your data, right? Institutionalizing the properties that you should see in your data. Okay, so I think this is all great. I think what needs to happen is we need to bring these things together and we need to extend them as a community uh, and in particular we need to we need to understand that there's lots of knowledge which isn't captured in in those point assertions about data so this comes from our observations in BT a colleague of mine John Malpass has come up with these these ideas um, so what we see is uh, sometimes people can't use the interfaces they're using so they they make mistakes Sometimes they don't want to, so they, they don't do it, right? And sometimes uh, they make mistakes because the interface um, forces them to make mistakes, okay? Um, uh, so uh, they, 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 just, they just make errors that are systematic because they're forced to make those errors. So a great example is if you do a job and you have to sign the job off using some handheld tool um, and you, don't, you read the menu items, and you think, well, it doesn't really fit any of those. What do you do? And some people will pick the one they think is closest to what they got. Other people will choose one at random. And most people, it turns out, choose the first one on the list. right? Um, and we know this. We, we can see it in the data. Um, we know it, and we talk about it all the time. We write it in documents. So, you know. But every time somebody new comes in, and touches that data set, they make the same errors all over again. They say, this is funny, look, I found this. It turns out there are more of these than you thought. No, that's because the interface is broken. That's just random. Don't, you know, don't make that error. So the point is, when you know it, you can control for it and handle it, okay, as much as you can when you're dealing with what is observational data using techniques which are designed for dealing with experimental data, which is controlled, which none of our data is, but you know the whole community ignores that problem, never mind that. Um, but you know what we don't have is good ways to institutionalize this and make it so that every analysis picks this up. The other one is change and expectation and characterization of errors. So this is um, VDSL data. And the network is, at the time when this was done, there was a program to build more VDSL. Uh, it was coming on stream on a regular basis. We knew how much data was coming in this week. We could predict very easily, you know, you can predict very easily how much data you should be seeing in a few weeks. We had the program details, so we could have written down, we expect it to continue to grow in this way until January whatever, whatever year, right? Or we could have said, there will be more resources coming on stream at this time, so it will grow faster, right? We knew all that. We had the plan of record. We also knew that we could observe systematic impairments in the data. Sometimes individual lines weren't reporting, and that was due to overcapacity, in, uh, uh, too much stress in the software in a particular cab, and it basically ran out of memory, and it couldn't do its reporting. So we knew that was going on, and that was the kind of error you could see. And we also knew that sometimes entire sets of cabinets wouldn't work for various reasons. And that was another type of error you could see. And we could have written that all down, and we could have furnished that with the data set, but we didn't. We, we didn't have a standard to do it. There's documents which explain this and graphs which explain this, but that's not, that's not institutionalization. So that is one piece of work that I, I think the community has to do. We need a way, a standard way of doing this, and we don't have it in my contention. The other one is mapping, as I say, characterizing the contents of a data store. And this is, I think, this is not tackled because I don't think, 
I don't think people who don't work in corporates understand this, right? We have a database that at one time had 90,000 tables in it, right? It had 90,000 different tables in it. And we had to prune that down to about 25,000 tables, which is the absolute bare minimum number of tables that that database needs to run, okay? Um, how do you understand that? Okay, this, this, this graph, uh, this visualization was drawn from the research cluster that we shot, right? Um, and, and it had 3,000 tables in it when we, we got rid of it um, because it was obsolete. Um, and what we decided to do was to try to understand what the relationship of those tables were one to another. And you know, the, 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 the reason we did that was because we suspect there's enormous hidden value, latent value, in, in, in the database, the data assets, because experience shows that when you combine certain databases together, you can produce insights that you otherwise simply could not combine. But which ones, right? And it comes out of a social interaction where we decide that these are the data assets we should bring together and then we will do some experimenting on them. But are there other things in there that could be combined? And um, what we were able to do was to, to use some graph analysis uh, to um, uh, basically demonstrate that uh, based on the database names, this is Hadoop, so we had various databases. We, with the databases, there were 31 databases in there, which had altogether the 3,000 tables. Uh, but we were able to actually produce uh, clusters of tables um, by various uh, uh, um, uh, graph analysis techniques uh, that had between 11 and 8 uh, clusters in, in there. And um, uh, we, we were able to show that uh, by removing vertices, from, uh, removing edges systematically or randomly from, from these, uh, uh, the, 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 the graph, we could reduce those um, uh, clusters down to the 31, um, uh, 31 uh, databases with, with removal of about 15, 20% of the, of the edges. Uh, and uh, that showed there, were, that there was a lot of stability in the clustering of the, of, of the data types within the database. And by inspection, which means little in the scientific terms, but by inspection, these clusters, which were repeated using the different methods, actually did uh, relate to particular domains of data uh, that were uh, un under investigation. And they did yield some surprising linking tables in there, which could have been useful if this wasn't a dead database. But that, the point was to say, can we, can we measure and map a data asset in some way that would allow it to be explored? And how should we do that? And the, the terrible secret, well, it's not a secret, it's in the paper we wrote about this, is we used the, the column names of the data tables as uh, the part of the similar similarity metric between the tables, right? Which is a fantastically stupid way of doing it. Um, but there's a whole range of mechanisms that could be used to do that a lot better. So some guys we work with at MIT have written a thing called Aurum, which is, I think, Farsi for gold, right? I think that it's about uh, hunting for gold. Uh, and we've been looking at that as well. And they use um, uh, Minhash on the column con contents. So they, they, there's this algorithm called Minhash, which turns out to, to be quite a good similarity metric uh, for certain sorts of data uh, when you apply it to columns, uh, when you apply it to corpuses of data. People use it for text processing as well. But it actually, we, we've discovered there's a real problem with it, which is it's really bad for, num for numbers, right? <laughs> so it gives really deceptive uh, results. It's not surprising when you apply it to numbers. But I'm convinced there, I there is lots of interesting work to be done in understanding similarity in databases and mapping databases. Um, we need to do it. And, and the only people I, well, I, this is the wrong thing to say. The people I've seen who are doing this are the people in Sam Madden's group at MIT and us. And that fills me with horror, really. <laughs> there should be a wide community approaching this. Um, I think it's the awareness of the scale of the problem. I, don't, I think data lakes are new, and heter heterogeneous domains of use of them is new, and, and it's happening in the corporate world. 
I don't think it's happening in academia. And like a lot of the, the big science stuff, the big science stuff, which is where academic big data is, that's one domain, you know, but that's not how it is for corporates. We have a whole load of different things going on, and that's where some of the problem comes from. And the opportunity. Uh, so one of the thing is, things we're interested in is managing data assets, and in particular around information security. And here what we did was we took the techniques that we used, we, we, we developed doing the, the data cartography work, the data scope work, and we've put them in a, a data lake inspector tool. And the point there is that we can do things like go into our data lakes and say the, the number of jumps between particular tables is x, right? And if x is low, that implies a high inference potential for those jumps, which is good for the data scientists, but it's also good as an information security risk because what you might say is, oh my goodness, there's one linking table which is binding this table and that table, and actually we cannot have those two tables linked because that allows an improper inference, right? A breach of privacy, for instance. You know, we cannot have that. We must not have that. Therefore, that must be deleted. So we can actually audit and inspect what's in there as well as put rules around it and tell people you can't do it. But we can look and say, this must go, which is, which is good. And I think here, th this opens up a whole, a whole range of opportunities as well. Because the question is, you know, for people managing a data lake, what advice should be available to them? Right? What, what should we be equipping people with to go and do that? And um, you know, what for the data science community, uh, what tools do you need to determine uh, what you're going to use, what data you're going to bring together? Because it's not cost free, right? And uh, we, we tried to do this with Aurum. We, we were trying to say in this project that we did recently, you know, here are the tables that you should bring in next, because they had a limited budget. They wanted to build a, a data mart. And the question is, well, what can, what can you say would be the most valuable things to bring in? And, and that's what we were trying to do, to say, look, you'll get the most linking out of this. It, didn't, it wasn't successful, but that's research. You know, but that's, that's what I'd like to do. OK, so uh, we're, we're out of time, uh, but I'll, I'll leave, you, leave you with a thought about uh, what are we really up to? And this is about what kind of science do we want to have? So we talk about data science and the science of data. The question is, what is that going to be like? And I think there are two models. Uh, there's the model of physics, um, which is predictive. Uh, and nowadays, it's very expensive and centralized, right? And that might emerge if we get the five databases in the world scenario, OK? So we're seeing large companies building data monopolies. And if that, if that goes on, then what happens is that only the Large Hadron Collider equivalents of um, data will be the venue for data science. Okay, that's that's what will happen. Um, on the other hand, we might get a, a data science and a science of data which is more like biology, um, which is descriptive in nature to some to some extent. But really, I think the fundamental characteristic would be that it's cheap and widely practiced. So people do biology in thousands of labs all around the world. And I think there's a big question for the community is, you know, what do we want to happen? How, what, what, what do we need to do to make the model that we want to happen, happen? And that's, that's all I've got to say. There we go. Thank you.